Good evening, everybody who are watching this program from India, and good morning to those who are watching from the United States. Welcome all of you to the live program number 109 at Orthopedic Principles. We are back with our exceptional faculty, Dr. Savia Sachi Tucker from John Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore, United States. Savia is going to talk about robotic total joint arthroplasty and is the future ready for it. Over to you, Savia. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gopalan, for inviting me once again. It's uh, always a pleasure to be back on Orthopedic Principles. Uh, good morning to all of those in the US. Good evening to everyone in India and Southeast Asia. Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk about something very exciting, something very different, which is robotic total joint replacements. Uh, and whether or not we are ready for this uh, in the future, that we are using several systems starting today, but what is the evidence behind it? What are the technologies? What are the different types of advantages or disadvantages? And that's what we are going to discuss. Uh, I do not have any relevant disclosures uh, for this, but I thought that I would give you an interesting historical perspective of modernism when it comes to Johns Hopkins. Uh, as Dr. Gopalan mentioned, I'm a faculty member at, in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Johns Hopkins. So this building that you see here on the left of your screen with my mouse hovering around it, that is the original Johns Hopkins Hospital building, which was built in World War I. Uh, it is known as the Billings uh, uh, Building. Uh, and now it's the administration building of the hospital with newer buildings uh, in the campus. Uh, this building is beautiful in its construction, very historic, uh, very beautiful open windows and, uh, and unique architecture. And they created the dome as was uh, customary during those times. But Johns Hopkins himself, uh, and it's interesting, his name is Johns uh, with an S at the end of it and Hopkins is his last name. He was a, a Quaker by religious preference. And in Quakers, uh, they do not have any idol worship. So uh, when he created this uh, building, he said there is not going to be an idol inside it. But as the hospital gained prominence and as patients started coming in, um, they wanted a figure to go and pray, some structure where they could go and uh, pray for their family members, for their friends who were admitted to come out of the hospital into the safety of their homes. So finally, they added this statue of Jesus Christ that you see here on the right. And this is a picture from right underneath the dome. Now, what happened was that by the time the building was already constructed, and this is a single uh, piece of marble and the statue created from a single piece of marble. So it was extremely difficult to break down the doors and bring the statue in. So what ended up happening was that they lowered the statue from the top of the dome. The top of the dome, they opened it, they lowered the statue all the way down. And that was quite a feat during those days. And in fact, there is a little scar right here on the right uh, chest wall of the statue where the statue basically hit parts of the dome and as it was coming down. So I thought that that's a very interesting historic perspective of modernism, even in those times when they were trying to create something. And here is another beautiful picture that I was fortunate to take. Uh, this is the view from the top of the dome with the dome uh, shadowing some of the people underneath it to where we traditionally obtain pictures with our white coats, either when we are coming into the hospital or when we are graduating. So another beautiful, unique perspective. So before we go into discussing the uh, technical advances in arthroplasty, I thought we would talk about what are the basic goals. The basic goals of arthroplasty, when you look at it, are two sides of a coin. The one side is what we as the surgeon or the practitioner see, which is the technical aspect. I want to do a technically very sound procedure. And the second, which is most important to remember, is the patient-oriented aspect. What can I do for the patient? How can I improve their quality of life? And what does the patient desire from this procedure? What are their goals in life? So let's talk about patient-oriented goals. For the most part, if we were to distill them into three very simple goals, patients want a stable, functional, and a very pain-free joint. 
These are beautiful pictures taken by a French photographer, Henri Cartier-Bresson, and he was able to capture movement, our activity in daily life, very beautifully with these pictures. And I thought that that would be a very nice way to showcase what patients want from their joint replacement surgery. When it comes to us surgeons, we would like something else. So and I have some videos to show this. So the first video is that we really want to try and restore the kinematics and the mechanical axis or the kinematic axis, depending on what believer you are, as we are performing a joint replacement. This is, you can see, a computer-assisted modeling of a total knee arthroplasty with the various degrees of motion. That is really not the scope of this talk. But as a surgeon, we want a nice smooth plane for the implant to articulate and eventually have some very good outcomes. Moving on to the next video, the other thing that we also want to try and do is that we want to have an equal balance, whether if it's in the knee, if it's between the medial compartment, the lateral compartment, the patellofemoral compartment, or in the uni, uh, we wanna make sure that we're not releasing any ligaments and we are able to passively correct the joint back to its native uh, profile. Uh, and if it's in a hip, what we wanna try and do is we wanna try and maintain that abductor tension to provide hip stability. So this is an excellent uh, device. It's not a robotic system, but it's a smart tibial tray called OrthoSensor made by this company called VeraSense in which you can see how the pressure changes between the medial side denoted by M and the lateral side denoted by L as the knee is taken through a range of motion. And this company provides these smart tibial trays as you are trialing your total knee prosthesis to give you a real time read of the pressure that the joint is seeing. And then as you begin to release the ligaments, you will see the pressures equalize very nicely between both compartments. And the reason we want to maintain kinematics, mechanics, and pressure is so that we can achieve longevity of the implant, of the bone, and eventually the quality of life for the patient. So these are two different sides of the coin that we now have to use technology to harness and make sure that we can reconcile these two goals. So what should be the goal of robotics specifically, but technology in general? The first picture on the left um, is a physician painting himself, painting himself and so on and so forth. So we want to make sure that this technology is reproducible. You can create an exactly same result for the patient if you're going to use that technology. Then you want to make sure it is easy for you as a surgeon to use. It is easy for the operating room staff to use. And it is easy for the hospital where you're working to acquire it, to store it, and to make sure that it is serviced properly. And finally, if we are going to go through all this trouble, we want to make sure that we see a benefit in our outcomes, going from fair or good outcomes to excellent outcomes. So that should be the real goal of any kind of technology. Now, as we discuss robotics, I wanted to kind of use cars as an example because some of this technology that we are now seeing in the operating room really comes from cars. And here are two examples. On the top left is an example of semi-autonomous technology, which is seen in a lot of cars. And I'm going to use a Volvo as an example. And then here on the bottom right is a Tesla. And I would just want you to focus on the differences in how these cars drive. And Tesla by far is the only path-breaking car technology in which there is autonomous driving that is available. However, that does have some limitations as you may have seen. So let's focus on the Volvo first. So what this device is, is a lane assist device or a lane keeping aid. So let's say you're on a highway like the Mumbai Pune Expressway um, and you have these nicely marked lanes all throughout the highway. Now, what happens is sometimes, you know, we tend to get distracted with music or somebody in the family saying something or pass a packet of chips or so on and so forth. And we may swerve from one side to the other. And if that happens, then there is a potential for the car to veer off the road and get into a car crash. So Volvo came up with this technology in which there is a camera mounted on the front screen of the car, 
which is visualizing the lane. And the goal of this lane assist feature, if you activate it in your car, is to make sure that the car stays in the center of those markings and doesn't veer to one side versus the other side. Now, if you want to change lanes, what you have to do is you have to give an indicator in the car. And if you don't give the indicator, the car, the steering wheel vibrates and brings you back to the position where the car wants to be. Now, of course, you can always override it because you are holding the steering wheel. So what it's giving you is a haptic control. It's a vibration-based control to make sure that your car stays in the center of the lane. So this is semi-autonomous technology because you ultimately have the control. The robot, the robotic system in the car is doing some things for you, but you can always override it. Let's look at the Tesla feature now. This is a very beautiful feature and a very beautiful uh, video that the Tesla company put out. So here on the screen in the car, you map out your route. So what you want to do is you put in your address and you say, I want to just go for a drive. And here goes the car. What it has to do, you can see that the driver is not putting his foot on the pedals. The driver is not touching the steering wheel. The steering wheel is moving all by themselves. The driver is just sitting there. Now, as this is going on, I'm sorry, the video seems to have, yeah, perfect. Um, as the car is going through its motions, now it's going into the highway, it is maintaining the lane, it is maintaining the speed limit, as you can see here in this number, it's 75 miles an hour. And when it comes into smaller suburban roads, it's going to reduce the speed limit automatically by looking at the signs that denote what the speed limit is. So here you go, here is the car now coming into more suburban roads. Again, picking up into the highway with about 70 miles an hour. And it's maintaining not just the lane, it's maintaining where you want to go, the speed limit, what other cars are around you and trying to avoid these obstacles that are in the way without the driver doing anything. So this is the fully autonomous feature offered by the Tesla. And again, you will see that the car also has to pay attention to road signs like stop signs, signals, so on and so forth. So it's performing a lot of complex functions uh, that are going through this uh, very fast paced video. Uh, now here you can see it's about 35 miles an hour and gradually the car is going to come back to its home destination in just a minute here. And you can follow along on the GPS how it's going to turn and where it's going to go. So now again, it's going to make a right turn, stop sign, acknowledged, and it's going to come back to its Tesla home base and the driver can get out and leave. So if you have a fun evening on a Saturday evening, you go out of town once the uh, lockdown ends and you have a few, few beverages with your friends and you don't feel safe driving home, well, here is a feature that may get you home safely. Now, with that being said, we're going to delve head on into the different types of robotic systems that exist today and discuss how you can register the bone, how you can perform your planning and how you can perform the surgery. So in orthopedic systems, this was the first robotic system that was introduced. Currently, it is known as Think Surgical, but when it first came out, it was known as OrthoDoc and RoboDoc. What happens in this platform is that you obtain a CT scan of the patient. Let's say you're doing a hip or a knee, you feed that CT scan into a planning software that is proprietary by the company with a planning workstation known as OrthoDoc. After that, you have a robotic system, several arms. Some of the arms are holding retractors, but this one arm right here, which I've zoomed into, is a milling arm. So what it is, it's a, it's a milling device that creates a very fine-tuned cavity uh, for the patient. And finally, you go ahead and you put the implant into the patient. So it really came about as a tool in the late 1990s, early 2000s to mill a cavity into the femur for a total hip replacement. And here is the example of how that robot performs. So their platform is called T-Solution 1. And this is our goal. Our goal is to put a press fit implant into a femur. So here is the planning software. You plan that. Once you have planned um, everything, you load that into the robotic system so that the robot acknowledges the plan. 
and you position the patient, you prep and drape, and then you make your exposure and you get the robot down to the hip. So at this point, you are in full control. You're obviously in full control of the plan as well. Now, once you are at the bone, you place these arrays. Uh, they are called the bone uh, registration arrays, which will then go ahead and interface with the robot and the robot will understand the anatomy of the bone and compare it to the CT scan. So this is a double check method. You have this probe, which is now um, used to digitally create the anatomy of the bone. So you're seeing the lesser trochanter and you're per performing very pinpoint um, uh, accuracy checks on different locations of the bone, which the uh, robot will then correspond with the CT scan to make sure that it's the same patient. And then here it introduces the milling arm. So at this point, you step away as the surgeon and you let the robot take over. Now, this is the only active or fully active system that is available on the market, like the Tesla self-driving feature. No other system is active like this. And you can always stop the robot in its tracks. But if you are not paying attention, the robot is going to keep milling. So there is no direct feedback to the surgeon, like a haptic feedback that, hey, you are veering off course. No, once the plan is set, the robot decides the further course, and then you have to follow along and you can only hit an abort switch, which completely stops the plan. Now, this was the, the hip application of it. Um, so again, you know, the, the cumbersome aspect of this robot is that you have to get a CT scan beforehand. You have to spend the time to plan the surgery. Like when you're flying an aircraft, you have to plan the route. Uh, you have to know where you want to go. And once you've decided on that and you've fed everything to it, you can sit back, relax and enjoy the ride. Um, the next level of this robot is that they introduced uh, the robotic platform for total knee replacements uh, at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons last year. Uh, and there was a caveat that it was not available. So it's in the trial phase in the United States at the moment, but it's the same type of milling arm. And now you feed data for the knee, the CT scan from the knee into the system. It plans it for you. And then what you can do is you can move the implant around in real time. So I'm going to try and scroll a little bit forward uh, into this uh, video. So the first aspect is getting a CT scan. The second aspect is feeding it into the robot. And the third aspect is the robot actually performing the surgery. So here is a, is a representation of the CT scan that is getting fed into the robotic system. You can move it around three-dimensionally and observe where the osteophytes are. The robot can do that. And here is the planning software. I want my uh, distal femur to cut be cut uh, an X uh, amount of millimeters, or I want to rotate my component or adjust varus valgus. Uh, and if I'm a kinematic believer, I want to have kinematic alignment. So you can do all of these fine tune checks uh, for the robot before you even go ahead and touch the patient. Once you have confirmed the plan, you feed that plan into the robot and then the robot takes over. So now here again, you perform the exposure for the robot. You have to hold the retractors in place. The robot really doesn't do that uh, too well. And then you observe as the milling arm comes and normally in a total knee replacement, you're using a saw. So the saw moves a lot faster, but here you have a milling arm that is very, very precise in what it does, but it takes a long amount of time. Again, before you begin, you are going to obtain some intraoperative landmarks that the robot has created for you to confirm your CT scan uh, and the anatomy. Now, the problem with the CT scan sometimes for osteoarthritis is that insurance companies may not approve of it. And you're adding radiation to the patient, which if you just use x-rays, you could avoid doing that, even though there are low-dose radiations, but still low-dose radiation CT scans, but you're still adding time, cost, and um, radiation exposure to the patient and to the personnel when you do this. Now, in terms of expense, this is a pretty expensive system costing anywhere upwards of a million dollars, a million US dollars. So it becomes pretty expensive in terms of an investment to keep. And as you can see, it's a pretty bulky system with a large uh, space that, that it has to navigate. 
and the robot doesn't drive itself into place, you still have to park it there, you still have to do the exposure, you still have to uh, monitor it because at some point, if your robot is not performing the plan and if you're not smart enough to catch it or quick enough to catch it and hit the abort button, it's going to do the procedure and then you have to figure out a way to recover without having a CT scan and only using your judgment and your landmarks. Moving on from Think Surgical, this is by far the most popular surgical robotic system that is out there for orthopedic surgery, which is called the Mako system. Mako was an independent company before Stryker acquired it a few years ago. And after that, Stryker has really taken a, a big giant leap and placed Mako into various different fields. Now, I want to contrast Mako with Think Surgical for a moment. Think Surgical is largely an open platform system. And it's the only open platform system that really exists out there. By open platform, I mean that you can pick whatever implant type you want and you can use it for your surgical approach and your surgical procedure. Whereas every other system that I'm going to discuss from here on out is tied to an implant company, which means that it restricts you in what type of implant choices you now have. So if I use a Stryker Mako, I cannot suddenly say I want to use a Smith & Nephew implant with this system. You can do it off-label, but the Mako's and, and any other system is only designed to work with that implant. So it's a very restrictive closed platform design. The best analogy I can give you is that when computers were first coming into the, the space, um, Apple was a very closed platform design because you can only use a few things with Apple. You cannot go and modify Apple uh, computers away from the company. The company controls what you can modify. Whereas some of the advanced programmers, uh, just like advanced surgeons, they want more flexibility. They want to use something sometimes, something some other times because they trust their judgment. And that is why Windows and assembled PCs really came into the market and really took off because you could do whatever you wanted um, with that company. So here is the big difference. Now, another big difference between Think Surgical and Mako, uh, when Think Surgical came out with its robotic system for hips, you can only perform the femoral component. You cannot do anything with the acetabular component. So Mako took it the next step. And here is the example of the Mako um, system. So once again, you have a CT scan that gets fed into the computer system and you can plan your component positioning with a CT scan. So I'm going to scroll a little bit uh, ahead towards that part of the video. Uh, you go ahead and you perform the exposure. The CT scan is in front of you to go ahead and verify what is going on. And then here is the robotic arm which lets you decide how you want to breathe. So here is a CT scan getting fed. And then you can play along with the leg lengths, the offset, the acetabular component positioning that you want to achieve. And this is the target. The green is the target, which once you finish your reaming becomes uh, completely white. And if you deviate from the reaming, it shows you a red sign. So you don't, you don't want that. Um, and it's showing you the center of rotation. So now once you've dislocated the hip, you go ahead and again, like the Think Surgical System, the robot tells you that these are all the landmarks that you have to achieve. Once you've achieved that on the femur and you've achieved that on the acetabulum, the robot with its algorithm states that, okay, the CT scan matches or please go ahead and acquire more points because I need more data to come up with the final plan. And once you do that, you now have a haptically controlled, so like a self-drive feature, there is um, the robot, robotic arm is what the reaver is controlled with. You go ahead and you position it, you look at the screen and you basically just aim. And here is a surgeon doing that. And as the reamer begins, you will see that that green area gradually shrinking and becoming white. And that's the goal that you receive or achieve. Now, if you deviate from the path, what happens is that the robot shuts down and it just stops. As you are putting the acetabular component in, again, there is a robotic arm holding you. So it's like a very sturdy assistant, which you tell them you want to be in this place and it holds it for you and you impact 
the acetabular component into place. And if you deviate, the robot just stops in its tracks and says, nope, I'm not letting you proceed. You have to adjust this based on your plan. However, when it comes to the femoral component, the Mako has absolutely no use. That is completely dependent on you. So here is a huge difference. Think surgical only lets you do the femur. Mako only lets you do the acetabular component. And if you want a robot, uh, a robot for both of those, you are in tough luck. You just don't have any application out there that lets you do that. Now let's look at the Mako for the total knee. So the Mako for the total knee has just uh, come outside on the market. Uh, once again, it is a CT scan based technology. So that's how the data is acquired. Once the data is acquired with a CT scan, um, what you would do, let me see if I can play this again for us. What you would do is that you would go ahead and you would get inside the joint, you would do the exposure for the robot and you would acquire various different points just like the hip to make sure that the CT scan matches the patient's anatomy. What is a cool feature with this is that the robotic arm is now replaced with a saw. The same robotic arm that was used to control the reamer can now have a saw attachment to it. So you don't have to rely on a burr. You can, you can be quick and you can be efficient with a saw. And what this robotic arm does is that you do not have to place any jigs or any cutting blocks on the patient's knee. The robotic arm will just move into place and you can then press the trigger on the saw, activate the saw and perform your cuts. And the robot basically holds your arm and it creates this green pathway for you and if you deviate from the green pathway, then the robot just shuts down. So now it's a beautiful technique because you don't have to use any pins, uh, any such external devices to fix your cutting blocks or your cutting guides. And you just let the saw work in space and then you come in and you perform your cuts and you walk away. Again, you can plan for a kinematic alignment or a mechanical alignment with the system based on your preference. Now you're taking your landmarks as I had mentioned and then you can play around with the striker triathlon total knee system, uh, which is the only total knee system that this robotic device supports. You can perform, you can plan your ligamentous releases uh, and also your range of motion analysis. The robot lets you do that in real time to see where the patient was. And here is the, the uh, lane assist feature, if you may, of the robot. You can see a cross-sectional section here on the top left uh, and as you cut it, you just look at the screen and you're trying to get rid of that green and you're trying to make it white. And you can do this without putting a posterior retractor. The robot is so precise that it's going to stop you in its tracks before you hit the PCL or before you hit the popliteal uh, vasculature. So it is very, very precise in how it is controlled. Now here is the third application of the Mako system. So this is by far the most versatile system that you have there, which is the uh, unicondylar knee application. So in this, once again, uh, as I mentioned, you have a CT scan, you have some intraoperative landmarks. Uh, so we are going to try and skip through that. Uh, we will directly get to the planning phase. You can plan the component positioning um, of this unicondylar system. Again, it is a closed platform system. So you can only use the striker unicondylar knee arthroplasty. You perform your verification checks at various different points in the robot. And then now, because the space is tight uh, in such a small uh, surgery, it has a burr feature. Once again, there is a green path, you use the burr, to take the green down to the white. And if you burr too deep, it creates a red area and it basically stops you in its tracks. So this is a this is a, not a retractable burr, but it, it basically stops. There is another platform called Navio, which I will discuss uh, in the next slides, um, which has a retractable burr. So the burr will just retract back into the patient or into the device. So this is, the Mako system. Mako is again owned by Stryker. Um, it's the most versatile system. It lets you do the acetabular component preparation in a total hip. Uh, whether it's an anterior approach or a posterior lateral approach or a lateral approach, it doesn't matter. 
It also lets you plan using three-dimensional CT scans. It lets you use a saw when it comes to total knees, and it lets you use a burr when it comes to unicondylar knees. The actual robot is the same. The robotic arm is the same. It's just that you have to purchase different um, planning software for the various different surgeries, and you have to purchase the different instruments for the various different surgeries. But if you are an arthroplasty surgeon, by far, these are the most common surgeries you would perform. Now, for in terms of cost, again, it's a upwards of a million dollar investment. So it's a pretty steep investment and it has a pretty large footprint, but it has been serviced the most across the world with the Striker platform. The advantage of using this device is that Striker is in all almost every country because it sells so many different hospital related equipment that they can find a rep to come help you with this. And you do need a dedicated representative that works with this robotic system so they can help you with the plans, uh, they can expedite the process for you and they can be there to move the robot as you are performing your surgeries. Now here is the Smith and Nephew Navio system. Um, Navio was owned by Blue Belt Technologies before beginning, uh, before uh, being acquired by Smith and Nephew, and now it is a purely Smith and Nephew system. So here is the planning and execution of the Navio for a unicondylar knee. Navio, the advantage of the Navio is that you do not require a CT scan. Uh, you basically paint the surface of the bone as shown here for the unicondylar knee, and then you can assess the implant positioning and the range of motion, uh, gap balancing, so on and so forth, as you plan the surgery. So it's real-time data acquisition. There is no pre-operative data acquisition or planning. You don't have to spend time, money, and radiation risk for the patient. And here is the retractable burr. As you can see, the burr is going in and out. So again, it's a haptically controlled semi-autonomous robot. If it, you deviate from the path, the burr just retracts and you cannot do anything with it. And if you're in the path, the burr comes out. So it takes a little bit of getting used to because um, you have to watch the screen. And if you want to be efficient with it, you have to make sure that you don't deviate from the path. You can also use the burr to create the drill holes or the peg holes for your final components. So it's a very precise uh, positioning of your components and then execution of the plan. And as you can see here, you perform the surgery and then you can verify your motion based on the plan that you created. Now they also have an application for the total lean. So again, very similar, no CT scan registration, it's direct registration um, as performed by navigation systems. You can see the eyes, the infrared eyes. So you have infrared markers that are attached and then you can map out, you can basically paint out uh, the patient's anatomy and it creates a representation for you right there on the table which you can then use to perform your surgeries. Again, this is a closed platform system, meaning that you can only use Smith & Nephew implants. You cannot use Striker implants if you want to try and use a Navio system. Um, and then it gives you an assessment of ligament balancing, gap balancing. Again, with this uh, device, you can choose whether you want to be a mechanically aligned person or a kinematically aligned person. Um, now, the initial... Navio application would basically let you use the burr and perform your cut. So that was perform that was proving to be quite time um, uh, consuming. And now what they do is that basically the guide, the robot is to use to create the drill holes for the cutting guide. And once you make those drill holes, you put your cutting guide, you don't have to use any other jigs in place you secure those cutting guides, you verify your cut, and then you can use a saw to go ahead and make your cut. So what it has done is that it's made the placement of your cutting guides more accurate. And the assumption is that if your cutting guides are in a good place, then your cuts are going to be accurate. But you still have to control your saw. If the saw goes too deep or too shallow, you are the surgeon and you have to monitor it. All it is doing is that it's positioning your cutting guides in place and then letting you take over. So it's a very different level of control as compared to a Miko platform. And Navio currently does not offer anything for hips. So if you purchase this uh, device and the cost is around uh, 200 to 500,000 US dollars, depending on what type of software, whether you just want 
UD or you want a total knee um, software. So it is probably half or one fifth the price of a Mako, but then you also probably don't get the full spectrum of surgical advances that you want uh, for all your surgeries. Now here is another device which Zimmer Biomed just came out with it maybe a year or a couple of years ago. It's called the ROSA. ROSA is again a closed platform device that you can only use with uh, Zimmer Biomet implants. You cannot use it with other implant systems. And what this device does is that based on real time information that you provide, it kind of merges the navigation based information that you can map out the bone morphology. You then go ahead and what it does for you is that it helps you hold the cutting guide in place. So when Navio makes drill holes and you can put the cutting guide into those drill holes, this robotic arm will hold the cutting guide in place, which you then pin into the bone and then you make your bone cuts. So again, a semi-autonomous system. Let's say if the leg moves, uh, the robot moves along with the leg. So it's essentially a different type of lane assist feature. And I wanted to show you uh, the video which kind of demonstrates this principle. So you have gone ahead and mapped out the patient's morphology. You don't need a CT scan. Now you bring the robotic arm to the leg and the robotic arm just holds that cutting guide in place. It is not going to let it go. You still pin it in place just for that added level of security. Now, if the patient moves or the robotic arm moves, it still understands where the cutting plane is going to be. And it's only going to allow certain degrees of freedom for you to position that arm. Once again, the planning software, you can plan how much resection you want to achieve and where you want your implants to position, whether you want kinematic or mechanical alignment. And as the patient moves, as this bone model moves, you can see that the robot is following it along. It's not letting go. Now, of course, that's within a range. You can take the leg completely off the table and it's not like the robot is going to keel over and fall. Um, again, for this application, they do not have a unicondylar knee application just yet. It is only for total knees. It is only for Zimmer Biomet products. Um, and they do not have a hip application yet. So this is another example of a semi-autonomous robot uh, used to perform more precise procedures. And finally, I wanted to discuss this technology called Omnibotics. Now Omni was an open platform system before being acquired by the Corin group. So now for the most part, you can only use Corin based implants with this system. And this is probably one of the early generations of robotic systems because it really bases its platform on navigation. So just like a navigation system, you do not require a CT scan. You have real time tracking um, from infrared balls that you attach to the patient and you can go ahead and plan your device on your surgery. Initially, you could use an open platform and use multiple different uh, platforms or knees, but now it's only restricted to Corin implants. So here is the example of mapping out the bony anatomy. And as you can see, you attach these infrared trackers, you confirm your landmarks. And then what happens is, I'm gonna scroll ahead in the interest of time, is that you have this robotic arm shown here in black, which allows your saw to come in and it's again holding your cutting jigs or cutting blocks in place. And it's going to move based on the sequence of sur the surgical steps. So you perform your distal femoral resection, then you perform your tibial resection. I'm sorry, you, you complete your uh, femoral resection and then you perform your tibial resection. So it basically is a smart assistant for you which takes you through the various steps of surgery and you can customize that and you can verify that and it holds your cutting block in place for you to go ahead and perform the cuts. But again, if you deviate from its path, it is not going to stop you. All it can do is control where the cutting block is in place and you use a saw. So another interesting system that is uh, now closed platform.
So we look through various different robotic systems. We look through the Think Surgical, the Mako, the Navio, uh, the Rosa, and the Omni. These are the five surgical systems or the five robotic systems that exist in the market today. There are plans for Depew to introduce a system where there's a robotic arm that's going to be clamped to the bed and which is going to be a very portable robotic system where you can take it from room to room. So I was a part of a group that published these studies in the JBJS reviews in 2017. First one was navigation and robotics and knee arthroplasty and second one is in total hip arthroplasty. And we kind of looked at the pluses and minuses. Big picture wise, robotic systems are of course very, very accurate and very reproducible. But the problem is that most of them require CT scan based planning. So that adds time, expense and radiation risk to the patient. And in certain countries where insurance companies very tightly regulate the field, you cannot get a CT scan that easily. So you have to um, negotiate with them. Uh, robotic systems overall are very expensive systems. And what has happened is in moving from an open platform design to a more closed platform design, when companies have acquired it, companies are striking deals with hospital systems saying, look, if you use our implants, we will give you the robot for free. So that seems like a very attractive offer, but we have seen that in the past when printers came into the market or different devices came into the market. When you had a printer, they would say, look, you can take the printer for free. What we're going to charge you for is the ink. And even though the ink may not be a substantial upfront cost, the implant may not be a substantial upfront cost. If an institution is doing thousands of joints a year, that's where these companies mark up the implant even so slightly and then make their profit and allow you to use their technology. So there are pluses and minuses to it if you look at it from a business perspective. And finally, what is important to realize is that there is a big push. A lot of patients are coming to our offices saying, hey, I, I watched this video or I watched this, uh, this beautiful advertisement on TV um, with Stryker saying that you have to get a Mako D, you have to get a Navio knee. Uh, can you do this for me? And I want just the Mako system. And you have to be careful because none of these systems are complete. Uh, Mako is by far the most complete system today as it comes to uh, servicing the needs of a surgeon. But you cannot logically and in terms of uh, economics have all systems available at your hospital. So you have to be careful what you invest in. Um, by means of this talk, I just wanted to kind of give you what the different platforms are, and also tell you that these platforms have really been in existence for the past uh, five years at most, and the outcomes are limited. There is no outcome in the medium term or long term showing that variations in alignment or accuracy in alignment to such a precise degree has caused any changes in the outcome of the patient. So that is important to realize uh, at the end of all of this. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Sabia. Excellent talk. Cutting edge, as always. A uh, few questions. Uh, see, I remember Prof. Uh, Ranawat saying that a knee replacement is a soft tissue operation and the bony cuts are incidental. So do you think the robo can assess the tactile feedback. I know you have the haptic system, but when you think of when you talk about the think robo system, I know you have a soft tissue tensioner that can look at medial and lateral pressures. But what about the releases? You don't you need the uh, tactile feedback? Absolutely. You know, so uh, Hitesh, you know, Dr. Ranawat had that insol philosophy, the insol Ranawat philosophy of mechanical alignment, where this was more of a soft tissue procedure. And the bony cuts, like you said, are incidental. It's just you need to do that to shape the bone for the implant. There is no robotic system that exists that gives you a tactile feedback. Um, same thing in a car. There is no car-driven robotic system that lets you say, hey, I am going on a very bumpy road or I'm going on a very smooth road and I may need to change the way I'm driving to preserve the passengers and preserve the car. So I think that that still boils down to the surgeon. Um, and that is still an experiential gain that you gain only going through the ranks of surgery. Now, a problem that I see with this robotic system um, and company-driven markets 
is that Striker offers a Mako fellowship in Europe for about six months where you would do Mako assisted surgeries. And that I think is a problem because that takes away the feedback that's in our fingers and in our hand that is critical for performing these procedures. Uh, true, Savia. The other one is, uh, what is the, uh, do you have level one data to compare the robotic system with the, any of say, navigation or even the conventional total knee? No, absolutely not. And I think that that's the biggest drawback. And, you know, level one data in, in large cases is very randomized and it's very hard to randomize these because based on um, the jigs that you have to put, the infrared trackers that you may have to put, that you would know what the, what the difference is. So we don't have any level one studies really showing a difference by, with using this technology versus not using it. The third question is, see, when we, I have uh, worked with uh, surgeons who do navigated knees, I know I'm in, in Bombay when we were in Breach Candy. So uh, the advantage is you have the tactile feedback and you know where exactly your nerve is or the vessel is. But do we have a risk of higher neurological injury when we use a autonomous system like the THINK system? Yes, so um, the initial data with the THINK did show an increased risk of injury to neurovascular structures, especially if you don't pay attention and protect them because the robot doesn't really recognize those structures and kind of goes about. And none of these robotic systems really recognize neurovascular structures. They just go about and if you don't plant those retractors, there is an increased risk. There's also an increased risk of pin side fractures where you have to attach these arrays and pins to the bone and patients have stress rises and, and fractures from that. Uh, so I think that that really boils down to us as surgeons being careful about that. And you know the, the other thing in, we are a very litigious society here in the United States. And if you can imagine, all of these robotic systems come with massive disclosures and disclaimers saying, if something were to go wrong, it really boils down to the surgeon. So it's not like you can go ahead and sue the robot or sue Striker and say, this was your pro product that I used and this was the result that I got. So they're going to sue the surgeon. Exactly. So even though the robot costs a lot, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you as the surgeon are responsible. And one thing that I find very unique, Hitesh, and maybe it's just the way I look at these things, is that I'm spending a million dollars, you know, let's say I want to buy any of these robotic systems spending upwards of a million dollars sometimes to buy them, they don't even drive themselves into the room. There's no remote control that you can push that the robot just arrives in the room. It still has to be manually lugged from one place to another, manually draped and calibrated. And that takes time. So if you want to look at efficiency and if you're running two OTs, you're going from one room to the other room, you essentially have to buy two robotic systems. And that's where they really get us. And how, uh, how frequent do you require the calibrations? Because that's the other area of interest. Every single surgery, every single case you require to calibrate it. So that's going to take a lot of time, isn't it? It, it adds time. Uh, and, you know, it adds at least when various people have looked at this, I think that, uh, you know, think surgical. If you look at some of the literature, uh, Dr. Long, who was uh, one of my professors in my fellowship, has looked at this very critically and it's adding 10 to 15 minutes in his hands. And he is by far a very experienced knee surgeon who's using this. So it adds the infection risk as well in those patients. And what is the system that you use? Do you have a, a haptic or an autonomous system right now at uh, Baltimore? Um, so at Johns Hopkins, we are still yes. critically looking at this. We don't feel that any of them service our needs just based off of the limitations. And then that restricts us in our implant choices. Um, so we, are, we haven't committed to any one system just yet. We have various different systems that we use on a case-by-case -case basis, but we haven't purchased anything just yet. Uh, Sabia, Sentinel is also here. And Sentinel is uh, as a staff orthopedic surgeon at Texas. Uh, Sentinel. Your questions to uh, Dr. Savia. <laughs> hey, uh, Savia, how are you? I'm doing great, Sankin. Yeah, so uh, it was a nice talk. You know, we are in the process of acquiring Mako. I, I don't have much experience with the Mako, but uh, I do have a lot of doubts about it. So um, do you think it has a role for every case or you think it has a role in only like a comp uh, complex cases? What do you think? It's, is it a value addition, real value addition? 
That's a great question, Senthal. So, you know, value can be looked at in, in a couple of ways. One is value for the institution and value for, I guess, uh, patients and value for business. So you, in terms of your administration, uh, maybe if you can drive more marketing and get more patients, there is value added there. Value for the surgeon is very surgeon dependent, but I think you hit the nail on the head. Does this really make sense for me to use for every single case? And the best analogy I can give you is, you know, when you go to your hospital or I go to my hospital, do I always need my GPS? You know, I don't because I think that I know the roads well enough and I know if there is a problem, what alternate route to take. However, if I am in new territory or if I'm in a revision situation or if I have a complex deformity and you know, I, I have to look at the CT scan, but I also have to think about complex planning. I think that's where the real value of these systems are. There is limited literature showing some advantages. See, for any of these systems, as long as you're not instrumenting the canals, uh, if you have hardware in the canal, there is uh, a value in using them because you can correct your deformity very nicely without having to go through, you know, a deformity correction surgeries. So there is value in that. However, when it comes to revisions, you know, Think Surgical is the only system that is published a little bit on this, where if you have a cemented stem that you want to revise, you could use that milling arm or the milling device to create that cavity and take out the cement, but no other system give you, gives you that advantage. So now you're spending so much money and our revision burden is increasing and you cannot use them to do revisions. So I think that that's a huge limitation in this field. Good. Uh -huh. So the cost, the, is there a CPT, different CPT code or a modifier when you ask for reimbursement? Fantastic. That is, uh, you know, for, for navigation, there is a code, imageless computer assisted uh, navigation, uh, which adds uh, probably, you know, anywhere from two to three RVUs. Uh, and robotics currently gets plugged into the same code. So, you know, whether you use a device like OrthoLine, which I use for a lot of my uh, knees, because it's a very simple iPhone like, you know, disposable device, it adds about five to $600 per case, but it lets you make a very perfect tibial cut, or you use a million dollar robot, you're probably going to get reimbursed the same. Okay. <laughs> per case. So the value yeah. is in, in, uh, in doing volumes, but like I said, okay. then you have to buy more than one Mako. Okay, uh -huh. and uh, this navigation, you can only use it for uh, people who rely on bony landmarks. So it can, like if you are a gap balancing guy, it's not going to help as much, like, right? Right, it's not gonna help you much, correct. Okay, good. Uh, my experience is limited as I told you, so I don't have any practical uh, questions, you know, like all this about uh, still the doubts in the for the in initial phase. So, um, do you think it's going to stay? Like the navigation came on, the, initially it was like the, the biggest talk of the town, everybody have to do it. Now we all know it has its own place. Um, so you think navigation is going to be something like that? Yeah, so I think that robotics uh, is going to stay. See, you know, there are certain features like, uh, like I described in the car, the lane assist feature and stuff, which just makes sense. Now, what has changed, you know, and growing up in India, as we all can relate to when we were growing up, you know, the car companies would give us options, you know, whether you want an AC or not, whether you want a manufacturer installed car stereo or not. And there were so many post market cheaper alternatives that you would buy a car without an AC and a car without a stereo and then drive into these car accessory shops and get all of this done for a cheaper cost. It may not have worked as well. So I think that um, from, from there now, today, nobody really asks whether you want an AC or not. That kind of comes with the car. Same thing for GPS. Nobody really asks whether you want a GPS or not. It kind of comes with most cars. So I think that we're going to see that. But what we're going to see is a push towards making it economically viable. Uh, we're going to see a push towards making it open platform as healthcare administrators and, and institutions kind of wisen up to this that, hey, why am I restricting myself on implant costs? And the company is giving me a robot for free. I mean, I don't, I don't care. You, I charge me for the robot, but I want to cut down on my implant costs. So I think that the way it is going to be packaged for us is going to be different. Uh, there is a surgeon in New York, uh, Monogram Orthopedics, and what they are looking at 
is that they are, they are going to allow you a more open platform design that you can use the robotic arm with various different implant systems as long as you can plan and you can execute that plan. So I think that that's going to be the way of the future. Okay, and we are, with the plan you said, is it going to be only a plan A and if you just have to stick to it or can, you can change the plan intraoperatively? Uh, intraoperatively, you can change the plan, but then once you've acquired the landmarks, if you change the plan after that, then the robot needs to get re-registered. And sometimes, you know, let's say you make a, a, a cut in the femur, you do your distal femoral cut and all of a sudden you're like, I don't like this then it's very hard to correct it because those landmarks of the distal femur bony surface have gone. Okay. So it's very hard to alter it at that point. So it is better to have the manual instruments available for the initial few cases, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, from, from a you know, surgeon perspective, you also have to then be ready to commit to an implant system and understand the nuances of that implant system. Uh, tomorrow being, if my hospital goes ahead and purchases a Mako, I'm a Depew user. All of a sudden, I have to think of using a striker. So I have to know the uh, the positives and the negatives of that implant. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Santil, if there are no more questions. Uh, uh, any more questions, Santil? Or shall we no, wind up the session? That's it. Yeah, I think okay. I'm good. Now, no more questions. Uh, thank you, Sophia, for being with us. I know you come from a family who actually includes computer navigation in India. <laughs> listening to you, and uh, we look forward for more cutting-edge lectures from your side. Thank you very much for having me. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, nice Sophia, for thank joining you. us. Thank you, Sophia.